Today we're starting a new series. You guys ready? Starting a new series this morning called Misidentified. Misidentified. Big word, huh? It's a series on identity in Christ. Um, the big question we're going to answer in this series, and it's going to build on the previous series, because I believe we're in a flow of God. Um, like, personally, I really wanted to just preach uh, like a totally different series, but the Lord says, no, just stay in the flow. I'm doing something and at New Life, and it's continuous. I'm like, Lord, but I got to preach about this and this and this and marriage. I got to preach about marriage and I got to preach about relationship. The Lord says, stay in the flow. Stay in the flow. So that's what I'm doing. I'm being obedient to my father. You know who my dad is? Do you know who I am? <laughs> my dad is God. Amen. In this series, we're going to find out who we are in Christ. In this series, we will discover different ways our spiritual enemy works to distort or disrupt our spiritual identity and why he does that. Did you know that Jesus said that Satan's greatest weapon is lies? Do you know that Satan, the best thing he wants to do is lie to you? I was talking to a young man and, and, uh, and I'm like, God loves you. And he's like, I grew up in church, but by talking to him, I recognize how many lies he believes. And those lies are stronger than the truth of the Bible in his mind. And I'm like, ooh, that's going to take some time. And so I, I began to pray for him because I'm like, Lord, no word I can say right now. This person has believed a lie. And Satan is the father of lies. And we, if we believe a lie, and if we identify with, the, the, with his lies, and then we imitate the people who live in the same lies that we do, it brings frustration, spiritual poverty, and crisis in our soul. Your identity is your foundation. If you build your house on the sand identity, it will crumble eventually. But if you build your house on a rock or on concrete, on a strong foundation, it will stand 200 years. Amen. Only God knows your identity. Only God knows my identity. See, the world wants to give us what, tell us what identity should be. Culture wants to tell us what our identity should be. The enemy wants to tell us what our identity should be. But the world didn't create me. Satan didn't make me. I was made and you are made in the image of God. He has the right to identify you because he knows what he built you for. Angels are built as servants and that's what they are. You are built, humans are built in the image of God to be sons and daughters of God. That's who we are. Identity. Your identity will determine everything. You know why people have identity crisis often in their life? Because they have put their identity in something other than what God says they are. Lots of people put their identity in their money. They put their identity in the success, into relationships. They put their identity in their religion, in their royal cause. Can I say that? They put their identity in politics. They put their identity in everything else, but never find out what is my true identity. What did God build me for? I know that He loves me, right? We know that. We love ourselves, we love others, we love God. But now, what are we built for? What is our identity? Because that will determine everything about your life. Let me tell you a quick story. You love stories, right? Jesus loved talking about, uh, talking with stories. Many years ago, when I was a teenager, I started a business. And my old boss, I was, uh, he was training me to be like an insurance agent. I never made a good insurance agent. I did pass my task, though. So I was licensed after like five times, but I passed that. <laughs> I passed the test. Anyway, so I quit this insurance thing. I, I thought it wasn't for me. I actually don't like office work. I thought I would, you know, until I tried it, and then I would spend waste time searching the web, being on social media, and I'm like, nah, that's not me. I need to be in it, okay? I need to work. I need physical work. Otherwise, uh, I have to go to the gym, and I feel like going to the gym is like 
waste of time. If I could work, that would be my gym, and I make money doing it. So it's like, you know, all right? And some of you who don't work physically, if you're not going to the gym, I don't know what you do with that extra energy. You need to be going to the gym. If you have a sitting job or like not a lot of moving job, you, how do you deal with stress? You eat, okay. <laughs> it's gym or eating. It's one or the other. Uh, amen. It, it, it's true. It's for me anyway. But anyway, so my boss named Ken, he built a new house. And in front of the house, he had enough money to put landscaping and sod. But sod is expensive. Cameron, right? You don't know that work. <laughs> Cameron is my landscaping guy. He's a good guy. <laughs> and... Um, Sod is expensive, so he uh, didn't have the money to put sod in the backyard. So he just let the weeds grow, and the weeds grew high. And by July, the weeds were like this deep. So he calls me. He's like, do you do seeding? And I just started my business. I'm like, of course. How hard could it be? My dad would force me to dig the garden and then pull the weeds. Like, I grew up doing that. Like, I said I would never work hard when I when I was a teenager then I grew up and I love working hard thank you dad my physical dad of course God had something to do with it too <laughs> and so he calls me up and, and I go and I give him an estimate I've never done it before so I go and rent a tiller and I till the yard it took hours because there was so much weeds in in that soil in that ground and after I till the ground uh, I had to go and get a power rake to break up all the clumps and rocks and and then we had to rake it all out then we had to take a two by four and even out the backyard you know to make it look good i mean i was so proud of the work that we were doing and then ken said listen if it costs extra i want the best seed possible i don't want just any seed i want like the best seed so i go to i think i went to ace i believe and we buy the seed and we uh seed that place backyard we, we we cover it we give them instructions that are on the back of the bag of a seating and we say water it every other day or whatever and so we're excited this was like our first big landscaping job so we leave this was about july in august i get a phone call from angry ken and he said the grass started growing good grew to about two inches and then everything died come on over quick and i'm like uh oh so i go to his house look and i mean there's few little patches of live grass everything else is truly dead yellow i'm like what the, what are we gonna do i'm like i did everything right i don't know what happened maybe the bad seed you know so but ken called another company who's been doing it for a long time and they came and tested the soil and the seed was good the soil was clay you know how they when they build houses they remove black dirt and after you have to bring it back well can never t i i didn't even think about it can never thought about it so we just seeded in clay <laughs> and what we thought was gonna be we thought it's gonna grow good and it did for a while eventually it brought a lot of frustration a lot of mistrust I haven't heard from Ken since. It's been 20 years. <laughs> so Ken, if you're listening, I love you, man. Let me take you out for lunch, <laughs> boss. <laughs> Same thing happens with our identity. It's important to know who you are. It's important to know who you are. The enemy wants to misidentify you. The enemy and the world wants to misidentify us. Because identity, true identity, is the building block of our life. Build a house in the mud and it will sink and tip. Build a house on concrete, on stone. It will stay for over 200 years in some cases. Identity. What does the word misidentify mean? It means to identify something or someone incorrectly. Let me ask you a question. This question is very important. It will determine the direction of your life. 
Who are you? Who are you? It, that question, if you answer it wrongly, will create a lot of frustration. But if you answer it correctly, it's the good foundation to build on. It's a great foundation to build on. You know, I believe that Jesus Christ came to show us who we really are. To show us who our Father is. And we're His dear children. And as dear children, God says, you need to imitate your Father. I know it's not cool for a young person to imitate their Father these days. Amen. Although the father is a lot wiser, and uh, I was trying to explain it to my kids. I said, uh, uh, son, you're in 10th grade, and our uh, youngest daughter, Hadassah, is in 1st grade. I said, who knows more? How long will it take her to catch up to you? He's like, 10 years. I'm like, you're right. But see, it's not cool in our culture to, to listen to the wisdom of the elders, um, and I've been there, I know, I, I thought my dad was stupid for, uh, and my mom was, just didn't know what she was talking about. And then I grew up, and in my 30s, I was like, wow, my dad is super wise. He knows so much. Amen. But, uh, but uh, to misidentify is to identify someone incorrectly. Imagine you're buying a refrigerator, and they send you a dishwasher. And say, what's the difference? Both can hold dishes, tomato, tomato. <laughs> right? Have you ever ordered, a, I, I've talked to a young lady, she was in the first service, and she uh, ordered um, a beautiful vintage white chair from Amazon. And uh, she was so excited to put it in her house. Uh, and then when it came in, it was a six-inch dollhouse chair. <laughs> Misidentified, right? She can't sit on that. No one can sit on that. Amen? Misidentify. Can I show you a few uh, pictures of uh, uh, misidentification? Let's, uh, yeah. A guy ordered a carpet, rug, carpet, and broiled. And look what he got. Let's show another one. Going bold. <laughs> Expectations versus reality. Next one. Uh, Tinder versus reality. Look at, look, at, look at that boat he's on. Reality, lawn chair. It's okay. Let's do this one. Me and my resume. Me at the interview. <laughs> Next one. Uh, ordered this on Amazon. Got that on Amazon. Is there one more? No, that's it. That's it. There was much to choose from. <laughs> It's frustrating when you don't get the results that you wanted. And the same thing, if, you, if your identity is untruth, you will get results that you want. If your identity is based on a lie, it will bring frustration. It will bring identity crisis into your life. Why do people have identity crisis? Because they've been building on their own identity. And before they know, that doesn't satisfy. See, you can run after success all your life. And then when you reach it, realize that it's tasteless. It's not what you wanted. See, success, oftentimes, the, the, the enemy wants to paint success as it's something... That will satisfy. It's something that will make me happy. And then when you reach that success, it doesn't. Because the only identity is the identity that's built on Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Why can't we build on other things? Good things. Why can't we have an identity? If you're a mother, why can't you identify yourself as a, my life is, I'm a mom. Because your children will, come on, preach it. They will grow up and leave and forget about you, no matter what you do for them. And then you're an empty nester and depressed and broken. Purposeless. Now, is it good to be a, a mom? Amazing. A dad? Amazing. That's good. But there's something, like it could be a secondary thing. But first, 
The foundation of my life is not my children. It's who I am in Christ. Did you know who my dad is? God. My father. Our, do you know who our father is? Our father who is in heaven. He's not just my father. He is your father. And if you can get a revelation, that's what I'm talking about. Because we hear about identity all the time. We hear about things in church. But if you can get a revelation of who you are in Christ, the enemy won't, make, won't, won't be able to bring doubt, discouragement, and depression into your life as easily as he does now. Because you know who you are in Christ. Identity. You build your identity on your success, and success is fleeting. Today, economy is good. I spoke to one of our relatives. He lives in Canada, and he had a huge business before 2008 crash. He had a cardboard business. He was making cardboard for uh, Ford, Chrysler, all these different companies to sell parts, you know, to put cardboard in parts. And then in one day, his whole business, he was like, he knew the mayor, he knew the governor, he knew everybody. I mean, he was it. SH in front of it. I mean, he was big deal. <laughs> he was it. And then everything fell apart. And he was like this I don't know who I am. <laughs> See, when you put identity in Christ, listen to me. I've been deceived in thinking success will make me happy. And then I reach success, and I'm like, success is shallow and taste. It's not bitter. No, no, no. It's just like it has no seasoning. Like you eat something with flat. Thank you, flat. It's like, imagine being joyful or depressed. Success is like somewhere in the flat, gray area. Thank you. Help me out with words. <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> Thank you. That's what success is like. It's like eating bad steak without A1 sauce. <laughs> the, you know, success. Success. Now, success is great when your identity is in Christ. Because you don't live in fear. You don't live in fear of losing that success because you can never lose Christ. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. All the things other than Christ or God can be, you can be separated from everything. Your spouse. You can be separated from them. They could die, and you'd be left alone. They can leave. Children leave. Success. Even people's minds leave. But Christ will never leave you or forsake you. So if you're going to build a life on a philosophy, of any philosophy, uh, that's what rabbis do. You know, Jewish people, why I think they're so successful, because they find a rabbi and they follow their teachings right we have the greatest rabbi his name is jesus christ and his teachings are true because he's the way the truth and the life build your life on him build your life on him Mis misidentification can i give you just a few more examples about misidentification um imagine you marry somebody right and then uh, next day after you marry them, you find out they're not who they said they are. How frustrating would it be? That, well, basically everybody has to find that out. <laughs> everybody has to go through that. But let me give you another, another, another example. Imagine going to a forest and you're kind of into snakes. You love snakes. Not this poisonous ones but just snakes and imagine you misidentify a snake thinking it's a playful uh, harmless you know uh, thing and then it bites you would it affect your life imagine planting a tree thinking you're planting an apple tree just you can almost taste those apples and then what happens uh, when the fruit comes it blooms the same 
But then when a fruit comes, it's a crab apple tree. And it's bitter. And it's little. And you're like, I didn't want this. And now you have, you have to dig it out. You have to cut it out and, and do stump removal and all that stuff. And frustrating. Imagine taking a good seed and believing you're planting it in a good soil. And then having it die on you. And not produce any fruit. And that's what the enemy wants to do. That's why so many people are frustrated in the world. Why so many expectations are not met. That's why we go to find a little bit of fun from different areas of our life. Because this foundation is wrong. And so we start having, we go from crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. I've talked to people. And they say, like, nothing goes, I'm cursed, he said. He says, I look at your life, and it's like you're, whatever you do is blessed. I'm like, dude, I have problems too. I have problems too. And he's like, whatever I do is cursed. I just talked to a person like that. I'm, whatever I do, I'm cursed. And I'm like, I got to preach this message. Because so many people, you, you cannot have good fruits from a bad tree. You can't have figs from a thorn bush. And if your foundation is thorn bush and you're expecting figs, you know that I love you guys. I'm not here for the paycheck. You know that. So what am I doing here? I want to, I want the reason I, we planted this church. Can I tell you this? Because I saw People go from crisis and crisis. Even in my 20s, early 20s, I saw people without Christ going from crisis to crisis to crisis. And I'm like, if they could find Christ, He can do what He's doing for me. That's why. Can I say I started a church because I love people so much? I wanted them to go to heaven? I don't know. I was too young. Can I tell you that? But I did know that Jesus could make your life better. I did know that. When you know who you are, when you are set in your beliefs, even science tells us you're confident and happier. When your identity is set, this is scientific study. When your identity is set, when you know who you are, you're confident and happier. When your identity is not set, you're always searching. And imagine this, if you go from... uh, Anything other than identity in Christ. It will self-destruct. It's designed by God to self-destruct. So you're always going from one self-destruction to another, to another, to another. Because our soul was created to find rest with our Father. With our Father. I'm not going to read to you a story from today because we're running out of time, but I want to talk to you about Luke chapter 15. It talks about prodigal son. How many of you know that story? Prodigal son story goes like this. There was a rich, wealthy father who had two sons. The youngest one came to his father and says, Father, give me a portion of my inheritance before you die. Okay, give it to me now. I want it now. So he took that wealth and went to a distant country. And the Bible says he wasted all his money. He lived a crazy life until he ran out of money. And then he was so hungry that he got a job feeding the pigs. And if you know Jewish people, they don't like pigs. They don't eat bacon. I work with a guy who's uh, Jewish, uh, and he's like, I want this and this minus the bacon. I'm like, yep, (laughs) always minus the bacon. I'm like, add the bacon. He's like, take the bacon away. But anyway, he goes and he, and he just in the gutter. He's in the lowest place. He wants to eat, and they wouldn't even give him pods that they feed pigs with. And then it says that finally he comes to his senses. He comes and says to himself, in my father's house. My father is a king. Because this story represents God and us. 
My father is the king, and servants eat and live better. Slaves live better than I live in my father's house. He says, let me go and apologize and maybe get a job. <laughs> can, you can I tell you that angels were created to do God's job? You were cr not created to work for God. You were created as a son and daughter. Piano was created to play music, not to grill steaks on. Although it has bars and strings inside. Angels were created to serve. You were created to be a son and daughter who, who serves. Because that's what we do. But you were not created to just serve. You're a son and daughter. And so he's coming back home. And father sees him from a long distance and runs to him, hugs him and kisses him. And he says, you back, you back. And the, and the prodigal son says, father, I've sinned against you and heaven. And I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. And father says, nonsense. You were not built to be my servant. You were built to be my son. Listen, listen, listen. God is not interested in you being his servant or a slave. If I, if I give my life to God, he'll make me a slave and I'll be like those religious people. Because religious people don't get it either. Oh, what's going on there? I'm preaching good. I'm causing the lights to go crazy. <laughs> lights are going crazy. I'm not worthy to be your son. And father says, nonsense. Bring the best robe in the house. Here's what he's saying. Who had the best robe in that house? The father did. The king has the best robe. And the father says, bring that robe and put it on this guy. But, but he didn't take a shower yet. He didn't clean up his life yet. He didn't clean up his acts yet. Ho, 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 ho. Put my robe on this guy. That's what God does. He takes his robes of righteousness and the garments of salvation and he puts it on us before we even wash clean. And then he spends the lifetime of changing us and making us into his image. I'm not worthy. He says, nonsense, you are son. Yes, you're dirty. Yes, you are stinky, but you are a son. He takes new sandals and puts it on his feet. He takes a ring, which represents authority, and he gives him back authority. We're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead. And then they always had this one calf, one sheep that they would save for a special occasion. Like... Imagine if you lived in that time and a president was going to come or a king was going to come to your house. You would have a special sheep. You, you fed it with special grain. Like you gave it the best food, the first fruits of everything. And so he kills that and throws a huge party. Hold on. Why did the youngest son leave? He didn't have enough excitement. Because he didn't know who he was. But really, he thought his father didn't know how to party. Right? Think about it. Why did this prodigal son, youngest son, left? Because he needed some excitement. And why do people leave God? Because we need some excitement. Because the world is exciting. Come on. <laughs> Math is good, I hear. It tastes, uh, it feels good. Makes you want to stop eating and drinking and just get more math, more math. But then what it does, talk to me. Math, we're on it. We're South Dakota. <laughs> Come on. What does it do? Come on, people. It destroys you. Your physical body, your mind, your relationship, your, your job, your everything. It destroys everything. But he was missing excitement. And I think church people are sometimes the dullest people. <laughs> Not because. Hold on. Can I say the truth? Not because we're not allowed. God does not allow us to have parties. 
It just, we don't know who we are. And so we feel like servants. Well, I got to work for God. I got to work for God. And maybe someday he'll throw me a party when I'm in heaven. That's what we do. But God says, throw your own party. God says, if you knew who you were, you would relax enough to have a party every weekend if you wanted to. Oh. The older brother. I'm just telling the story, remember? The older brother. I got four minutes left. Okay. He's in a field. He's working, toiling. Sweat of his brow. You know, he's just working hard. He's coming home and he hears music and dancing. He never heard it before. If you're a parent, um, you throw parties for your kids when they're little, right? And then they grow up and then they think your parties are lame. <laughs> and so there's a season of like, it's a weird season, if, you're, if you know what I'm talking about. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. Parents, stop throwing you parties because they expect you to throw your own party because now you're grown up and you can do it how you want it and invite people who you want because we're going to invite old people to your party. <laughs> right? So, so, so there's that transition. But what both sons didn't realize that they could have as much fun at home the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow. You can have a party with no sorrow. In the Father's house. Or you can have a party in a distant land with prostitutes. Lose everything. Lose everything. You, you know this. Come on, guys. You know that living for pleasure... If your identity is pleasure, you'll live for that. If your identity is money, you'll live for that. We'll eventually self-destruct. And you end up in jail, in a shelter. You end up on a street. You, you, you end up losing your family. Nobody wants to talk to you. Your wife doesn't want to talk to you. Your husband doesn't want to talk to you. Your kids don't want to talk to you. You lose everything. But why did, you, why did he leave in the first place? Not enough excitement. That's why our church has to be the funnest church. That's why the people in the church have to be the happiest people. That's why you have to know who you are in Christ. So you're not a bored. <sighs> so boring. I just worship you. What are you doing for fun? I worship Jesus. I go to church. There's more to life. You can identify yourself with the religion and, and still be a dull person. That's, if any, you can identify with a political cause, anything, but unless it's Christ, you will keep experiencing identity crisis to identity crisis to identity crisis. It has to be the foundation of my life is Jesus Christ. One day I realized and I said, I'm done living for success. I had to come to that realization. I'm done living for success. Whether I'm successful, whether I achieve something, it doesn't matter. I am already, my name is written in the book of life. And my father knows me. And he's a king of the universe. And he loves me and he knows me and he has a purpose for my life. And I'm going to do my purpose the best I can by his power by his grace but i'm tired living for success i'm tired of living for possessions it's christ alone and then everything see bible says jesus said seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and having that right standing see identity is right standing with god when your identity is in Christ, you have a right standing with God. When your identity is in something other than Christ, you are not righteous because you're not in right standing with God. You have put something else on the throne of your heart and eventually you will have a crisis. Identity crisis. Identity crisis. 
and you'll try this identity and it will self-destruct and you'll try this group of people you'll go to jocks the nerds the help me out pump pumps um the cheerleaders you'll go to this that, and you'll try different things until you settle yourself in christ pump pumps <laughs> I know I'm not cool, I know. <laughs> but I am a son of God. <laughs> and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And I, it is what it is. Did you guys enjoy this message? This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. So make sure you're here. Because every message is built on the previous one. We're building something. Amen. Would you close your eyes and bow your head for a second? few seconds i want to ask you do you know jesus is he the lord of your life you can't have identity in christ if you are if you don't even know christ if he's not the lord of your life did you know that god loves you and there's a reason you're here this morning he brought you here because he wants to save you he's like the father in the prodigal son story standing there with arms open wide ready to receive you ready to throw you a party ready to put a robe of righteousness over you before you even can Become a better person. He wants to wrap you in the robes of righteousness. He loves you. And just like a refrigerator. It could be the best refrigerator money can buy. But it's, if it's not plugged in into the source. Power source. It's useless. It's not doing its job. It could be, doing any, it could be storage. But it's not doing its purpose. So same thing. Until you plug in into Christ. Until you say, God, I'm coming home. Spiritually speaking, I was lost and I'm not, now I want to be found. Christ is calling you today. He says, I, I did not come to condemn you. I came to save you. And so on a count of three, if that's you, if you maybe gave your life to Christ a long time ago, but you don't know where you stand with him now, I want to give you an opportunity to raise your hand and say, I want to follow Christ. Or maybe you've never given, given your life to Christ and you want to do it today for the first time. On a count of three, would you raise your hand and raise it high? I'm not going to invite you to the front right where you are. This is a private moment. On a count of three, God loves you. How can he? I don't know, but he does. Who said so? He did. On a count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Three, raise your hand and raise it high. One hand, two hands, three hands, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Thank you, got you. Ten, go ahead, put him down, put him down. Is there one more? Is there one more? I got you, sister, I got you. One more, eleven, thank you, hallelujah. Twelve, thank you, yes. Wow, 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 wow. If you raised your hand, you just made a decision you reached out to heaven with that hand and God will never reject he'll reach out and grab you and pull you out and he's doing it right now I want to pray with you say God you are my father thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins from this moment on I'm coming back home thank you for receiving me back from this moment on my sins are forgiven I'm a child of God because of Jesus because he's the bridge between me and my father I am saved I'm forgiven and I'm son or a daughter of God. Say it how, whatever you are. I'm a son of God. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to New Life Sermon Series Online. If you're blessed by these messages and are interested in helping spread the word of God to others, make an investment today. You can give at newlifechurchsf.org. If you have a story or a testimony to share, let us know on our website as well. We hope you have a blessed day and enjoy today's message by Pastor Alex.